gracious. Thank you, Father, for putting your words in my mouth. Thank you, Father, that uh, the words you put in my mouth, they could come out and that they could be spirit and they could be life for all the people that would ever hear them, this message. That they could find their lives born from your word about forgiveness. That they can find their lives born from the truth about what you've done in Jesus. And that they could find themselves experiencing this close, intimate, face-to-face -face fellowship with you. And they could find the fullness of who you are being born in them. And that they could experience the life that uh, you came for them to have uh, in the here and now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. So we'll start with people that like to look in their Bibles um, with Luke chapter 1, verse 77. Luke chapter 1, verse 77. Boy, there's a lot of verses in Luke, huh? Who could have known? <laughs> Who could have known there's that many verses in Luke? And what Luke um, says is, to, that, and he's talking about Jesus coming, and he says that um, he came to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of or the forgiveness of their sin. So he came to give knowledge of salvation to his people, that's all of us, through the forgiveness or the remission of sin. Okay, now when you look at that word knowledge, it, it's very interesting. It means that he came to make his people acquainted with salvation. He came to do something that could make his people have intimacy and communion with salvation. OK, and he came that they could have intimacy, that they could have communion with this thing through salvation. And the way that they would become acquainted with salvation is, which means the way that they would find salvation being born in their hearts, in their bodies, in their minds would be through something called the forgiveness of sin or the remission of sin. So the way that we would have intercourse or communion with salvation, meaning becoming one with that thing, is through something that Jesus would come and do to forgive our sin or to send our sin away from us or to lift our sin off of us um, or to divorce us from sin. That's the thing that he came to do. Okay, so salvation is experienced through the power of forgiveness. That's what salvation is experienced through, the power of forgiveness. All right, and that's what we're talking about. And for so long in my life, I just heard about salvation, but I never experienced and I never experienced it. And I thought this was just as good as it gets. And then um, I turned into thinking that salvation meant that everything would go right for me in this earth, that I would have a big, huge house and I would have a Lamborghini, you know, and I'd have gold chains like Mr. T. And, you know, I would just be like big pimping in the earth, right? <laughs> but then I realized that ain't salvation. That's just life in the earth. And so what I, then I realized salvation was talking about a quality of life, not what I had in the earth. It was talking about me experiencing the very life that God has, okay? And um, meaning that I would experience his love, his joy, his peace, his kindness, his meekness, his long suffering. I would experience all those things as I walked this earth. And the way that I would experience these things is through something called the forgiveness of sin, okay? Um, now, what we've done in the church is we've stripped forgiveness of its power to manifest in our lives by making forgiveness about God was mad at me because of my bad behavior, and now that he got his anger out on Jesus, he's no longer mad at me, okay? We've stripped it of its power to give us communion and fellowship with salvation by making it about God was mad at me because of my behavior and now he's no longer mad at me because he got his anger out on Jesus at the cross, okay? Now, the apostle Peter said that if anyone does not find the fruit of God's life being born in them, they have forgotten that their sin was purged from them of old. Or they have forgotten that their sin was forgiven them, sent away from them, divorced from them at the cross in the body of Jesus. Okay? So he says if anybody isn't experiencing this communion or intercourse with salvation, if anybody doesn't find the fruit of God's life being born out of them, it's because they've forgotten that God has sent sin away from them at the cross. They've forgotten they were purged from sin. Okay? Now... The way in which we preach forgiveness has caused people to forget their sin was purged from them at the cross, okay? We preach forgiveness in a way that caused them to forget that sin was purged from them um, at the cross in the death that Jesus died 
as our representative because we have preached forgiveness in a way that has caused people to identify who they are with what they do. Okay? We've preached forgiveness in a way that has caused people to forget that their sin was purged from them at the cross in the body of Jesus' death as our representative because we have preached forgiveness in a way that has caused them to continue to know themselves according to what they do. And that God was knowing them according to what they do. Because if God was angry with their behavior, then God was looking at them and he was judging them based on what they were doing. And so when we preach forgiveness from that standpoint, it causes us to forget that sin was sent away from us. It causes us to forget that sin was purged from us because it makes us continue to know ourselves according to what we do or according to the flesh because we say that's how God was knowing us. You see what I'm saying? Listen, man, God has never confused who you are with what you have done. He's never looked at you and defined who you are or your value and worth to him or your beauty to him based on anything that you've done. He's never known you that way. Glory to God. Forgiveness is designed to come in and circumcise your heart from knowing yourself according to what you've done by showing you that God's never known you that way. <laughs> you see, when this happens, what will happen is, is you'll be made whole. <laughs> right? You'll be made whole. Okay? And th this was really what the word salvation means. It, it comes from a root word that means to make well, to heal, to restore to health. Or we could say that, um, we could say it means to make whole, okay? So salvation means to be made whole. The power of salvation to make us whole is found in forgiveness, okay? That's where it's found. Um, so forgiveness is the action of God to make man whole again. Okay? Forgiveness is the action of God to make man whole again. Now, we have to first define what it means to be whole. And I have to be very careful how I say this because people are so sensitive nowadays with terminology. Being made whole is not talking about how God views you. Okay? Being made whole is not speaking of what God thinks of when he sees you. Okay? So God thinks you're beautiful when he looks upon you. He thinks you're perfect and complete when he looks upon you. He doesn't look upon you and see that you lack anything um, that, that you, he doesn't see that you lack anything to make him happy. He doesn't see that you lack anything to be his child. He doesn't see that you lack anything to where he would want to hang out with you or to walk with you in the cool of the day. He looks upon you and he doesn't think you lack any of that, okay? But that's not what wholeness is talking about. Okay, so we want to define the foundation that will understand whole or what it means to be made whole from. Okay, now God created mankind to occupy a certain place inside of the Godhead. Okay, he made man to sit at his right hand in the place that we see Jesus seated at right now. Okay, so God created man to be seated at his right hand, to be seated in the Godhead, and to live a life with him from the foundation of son. That's the place he created man to occupy when he made them. Okay, now, from that place, or from being seated at the right hand of God, and enjoying a fellowship with God from the foundation of son and daughter, and God as father, what happens is, is his life, or the fullness of who he is, can be born in you. Okay, so God created us to experience a certain kind of a life, and it's the life that's described as love when it says God is love. And he created us to find that life from feeling in our hearts that we are his beloved sons and daughters, full of glory and honor, in whom he's well pleased. And then we see ourselves seated at the right hand of God. Okay, so being made to be whole would be to see yourself seated there and then to find the life that you were created to experience being born in you. That's being whole. Okay, you guys following that? So that's what it means when you're restored to this life and this fellowship that I'm talking about is when it's what it means to be made whole. Okay, um, and I'm sure I'll get a bunch of emails that'll say, Greg, we are whole. Well, then you don't understand what whole means, okay? Yes, I'm whole if the revelation that uh, 
God revealed His Son in me has been born in my heart, then yes, I'm whole because I see myself seated at the right hand of God and I'm experiencing the life of the Godhead manifesting in me. But if I don't see myself as son or daughter the way God sees me and I'm not experiencing the life He created for me, I'm still walking around sick and thus not whole. Okay? Glory to God. That doesn't have anything to do with how God views us, though. Right? <laughs> Grace people got real sensitive over the last few years. You notice that? <laughs> Glory to God. I love you guys. I love you guys online. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> so the forgiveness of sin is the action of what God has done through Jesus to make us whole again by making a way for us to once again stand face to face with our Heavenly Father and find His life being born in us. Okay? The forgiveness of sin is the action of what God has done to once again make a way for us to stand face to face with him and find the fullness of who he is being born in us. Okay? That's how God does this thing. All right? Now we're going to look at these, these scriptures in 2 Peter chapter 1, um, verses 1 through 9. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Man, can I just say something? It is so painful for me to try to talk slow. Gosh. You know, it's like I think I enjoy it the most that way because I was an athlete. And so unless I get worked up up here, I don't feel like I even preach, you know. I feel confused. I feel like, was I at church today? <laughs> so 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 9. It says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be made partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the crux of what we're going to get at. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his sin or he was forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. Okay? He who does not find these things born in him has forgotten that he was purged from his sin of old. Of old is talking about 2,000 years ago at the cross. Okay? That's what he's saying. They've forgotten that. So what Peter is teaching here. Um, and it's a great foundation. He's teaching what gives birth to the life of God in people. And um, he also is teaching what, act, what can act as a stumbling block to people experiencing the life of God. Okay? And in doing that, he's also telling us the only message that we should preach if people aren't experiencing that life and if they find that they're experiencing another kind of life. So if they're lacking the fruit of God's life in them and they're finding the fruit of the flesh all the time manifesting in them, Peter is giving us, um, I hate to say this like this, but he's given us basically a mandate of the only message to preach that would save them from that, okay? So we don't need to wonder, what is the message that we preach, okay? We'll know what, it, what we preach here. So in these verses, Peter's describing um, the divine nature. He's describing the life of God. He's describing the fruit of the Spirit when he runs down those things. And then he says, if anybody doesn't find this life being born in them, if anybody doesn't find this life manifesting in them, if anybody doesn't find that they're experiencing God's quality of life, it's because they're blinded. Okay? And then he, he equates being blinded to having forgotten that they were purged from their sin 2,000 years ago at the cross. Okay, so a person who was blind in Peter's eyes would be a guy who forgot that God had divorced him from sin at the cross. A guy who has forgotten that God um, lifted sin off of them, that he sent sin away from them, that he divorced their union and fellowship with sin 2,000 years at the cross. Okay, so that's what Peter's talking about here. Now, the word purge speaks of being cleansed from sin 
um, purified from sin. It speaks of being cured by the removing of sin. It speaks of being cured by the removing of sin. Okay? That's what the word purge means. And the terminology used for the word purge is directly connected to the word forgiveness of sin. It's directly connected to what the forgiveness of sin is. Okay? And um, what the forgiveness of sin accomplished on behalf of mankind. So Peter is saying, if anyone is not experiencing the life of God, if anyone is lacking the fruit of God's life, it is because they have forgotten their sin was forgiven at the cross in the death Jesus died as their representative. And hopefully I'll say that like 10 times through the course of the message, and then you'll remember that part. Glory to God. What do they say? You have to hear something, write something, and see something, and then you can remember it? Something like that? I don't know. Sounds like a law. (laughs) Uh, So now the question becomes, um, how can forgetting we were purged from sin or forgiven from sin, how can, forg- how can forgetting that we were forgiven of sin at the cross cause us to be ma- lacking in the manifestation of God's life? And look, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to develop a trail here, so just bear with me. And at the end, it's just going to, kapam, smack you upside the head face, you know? Um, that's just a funny word Becky and I use with each other. Um, and hopefully I don't pick this 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 cut on my head and start bleeding out of the head again. But if I do, listen, it'll be like a visual aid, you know, the blood. You know, I, I preached about why blood was needed for forgiveness last week, and I shaved my head so I could look kind of pretty before I went to the Bible study, and I wasn't paying attention and just mm, right into my head. And so, you know, the head is hot, and there's a lot of blood flow in there. You know, I'm a smart guy. And, and, and so, man, the blood was like pouring out of my head when I went to this Bible study, you know, and we're talking about why blood is needed for forgiveness. And You know, I've got this rag on my head trying to stop up the blood. (laughs) Oh, man, I'm silly. Glory to God. So um, how can forgetting we were purged from sin or forgiven from sin at the cross um, cause us to be lacking in the manifestation of God's life in us? Um, And I'm just going to define sin and iniquity. And I'm going to define sin in a way that if you've never been here before, you ain't never heard sin defined this way. And it's going to flip the script for you. Um, But sin or iniquity is the trusting in the strength of the flesh for life. It's trusting in the works of our own hands to be pleasing to God and to partake of his life. Okay? That's what sin is. Now, this persuasion is propagated by us knowing ourselves according to the flesh. It's propagated through the belief or the persuasion that says, I am what I do. I am what happens to me. I am what the world says about me. Okay, so the belief or the persuasion in a person's heart that says, I am what I do, I am what happens to me, I am what the world says about me, when that persuasion can dwell in the heart of a human being, what it does is, is it causes them to trust in their own ability, it causes them to trust in the flesh for life, it causes them to trust in the works of their own hands for life, and that is sin or iniquity. Okay, you guys following that? Now, um, this is why the preaching of the, the death Jesus died at the cross is so important. Because we are designed in a way to keep hearing, to hear and keep hearing the message that we were crucified with Christ unto every voice about who we are that is not Jesus. There is one voice about your life that is true, that voice is Jesus. The preaching of the cross, what it does is, is it keeps reminding you that you were crucified to every other voice that could ever come against your identity or who you are at the cross. So those voices can't dwell in your heart and create a persuasion about who you are in your own heart. Glory to God. Okay? So when this can happen, when we can see that we're dead to every voice outside of Jesus about our life, it's unto salvation in our souls and healing from the fruit of death manifesting in our bodies um, through the power of forgiveness to send that sin away from us. Okay? So he sends sin away from us. He sends the identity or the picture that we had of ourselves that was defined by what we do, what we have, or what the world says about us. That created a picture about our lives. Now the forgiveness of sin is God coming in and at the cross dying away that picture and sending that picture away from us. That's purging us from sin. Now, when that picture can be purged from my heart, I'm not going to trust in my own ability. I'm not going to trust in the works of my hands to be pleasing to God or to have life. You see that? So Peter says, if anyone's not experiencing God's quality of life, they have forgotten their flesh was washed clean with pure water, never needing to be washed again. 
They have forgotten they were crucified with Christ unto an identity defined by what they do, an identity defined by what the world says about them. They have forgotten they were crucified to life through the strength of the flesh to do. They have forgotten they were crucified to life through the works of their own hands. Okay? That's what he says they've forgotten. That's the thing that will keep them from seeing the life of God manifesting in them. Glory to God. Okay? Now, how does that work? And this is how it works. He says, and because they have forgotten their sin was sent away from them at the cross through the blood of Jesus, they have continued to walk after the flesh. You see, they didn't see the man that was defined by the flesh sin away from them when they saw the blood running out of that guy at the cross. And so they've forgotten that guy was crucified at the cross. And instead of doing like Paul, where he said, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ living in me, they continue to walk after the flesh. They continue to walk as if they were Adam and not as if they were the son. Do you see? Do you see what that means? Glory to God. And so when they're walking after the flesh, they're still trying to create a persuasion in their hearts that they are clean, that they're acceptable and well-pleasing to God through the good works that they do and the bad works that they don't do. And that's really what we're doing when we're trusting in the strength of the flesh, guys. We're trying to create a persuasion in our heart by our ability to do what is good and not do what is bad, and then from that place try and create a persuasion in our own heart that can convince us that God is happy with us, that can convince us that we are good, that can convince us that we're well-pleasing to him. And then from that place we try to have life. Okay? So when you're walking after the flesh, that's all you're doing. You're essentially, um, what you're doing is you're trying to wash yourself clean. And you're trying to be acceptable to God through the works of your own hands. You see what I'm saying? Glory to God. So um, if we continue to walk after the flesh, and this is what's happened to the church worldwide for like 1,500 years. The church worldwide has continued to walk after the flesh. And so what's happened is, is our knowledge of Jesus dying on the cross has become unfruitful in our lives because we've forgotten that we were purged from sin. And so we have this historical knowledge that Jesus died on the cross. We say Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus did die on the cross for sin. But because we've forgotten what that even means, that knowledge has become unfruitful in our lives. And that's what Peter was talking about. He said, if you find these things manifesting in you, it means that your knowledge of Jesus as the Son is not unfruitful in your life. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Um, so, um, th- where am I at here? The reason that walking after the flesh um, causes what Jesus has done to be unfruitful in our lives is because if we're walking after the flesh, walking after the flesh will always act as a veil in our hearts, keeping us from experiencing the presence of God. It will always act as a veil in our hearts telling us that we're separated from God, telling us that God's not happy with us, telling us that um, we should be afraid to be looking at that guy in the eyes because who knows what that guy's thinking when he looks at me in the eyes. So it creates a veil in our heart, and that veil acts as a separating partition to experiencing the presence of God, okay? Now, when that veil acts as a, 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 a separating partition, keeping us from experiencing the presence of God, that also acts as a separating partition, keeping his life from being born in us. Because his life is born in us when we're in his presence. His life is born in us when we feel confidence in our hearts, standing face to face with him. Psalm 16, I think 11 or 12, says that fullness of joy is in the presence of God. It says that the abundant life is in the presence of God. This is what Peter is talking about. If you've forgotten that your sin has been purged from you at the cross, the knowledge of what Jesus has done is unfruitful in your life because you're not feeling the presence of God. You're not experiencing the presence of God because you feel separated from him. And if you're not experiencing the presence of God because you feel separated from him, then his life can't be made flesh in you. And you won't be whole. You'll still be walking around sick because you won't be experiencing the life of your design. The fruit of the Spirit is, and it's a subtle way that we say these things, guys, the fruit of the Spirit is not something for you to do. It's not like, here are these good things, you're supposed to do them. No, no, no. The fruit of the Spirit is something that God said, boy, man would really enjoy life if they could experience what I experience. You you see the difference? You see the difference? It's about a father saying, look how great this life is that I have. Let me have someone that can also feel how awesome it feels to feel this way. (laughs) Uh, You see the heaviness just lift? 
you see what happened is your heart just right there became circumcised from knowing yourself according to the flesh. See, you just walked, you're walking after the flesh less just from hearing that. You see, already you're feeling that veil being torn. The veil being torn in your heart. The veil's already been torn. It's just the question is, will you find a persuasion in your heart that says that veil's torn? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, glory to God. So life is found in experiencing the presence of God. Life is found in experiencing the presence of God. This is also described in the Bible as standing face to face with God. Adam was face to face with God in the garden. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now that word, with, means face to face. It was talking about Jesus as the Son being face to face with God. They were having a face to face fellowship. That's where life is found. So life is found in the presence of God. It's also described as being face to face with God, or what was represented in the Old Testament types and shadows, um, depicting the presence of God or where the, the, oh, I lost where I'm at. It was represented in the Old Testament types and shadows as the holiest of holies in the tabernacle. Okay, the presence of God or being face to face with God was represented as being in the tabernacle um, or being in the holiest place in the tabernacle. That's what the Old Testament types and shadows are pointing to. Okay, and this was the place where a person would need to be in order to find themselves standing face to face with God. You would need to be in the holiest place in order to find yourself standing face to face with God. Okay? Now, only, only in the Old Testament, only the high priest could enter once a year and not without blood. Okay? The, there was a veil that was keeping man out of the holiest place, keeping man out of the presence of God or keeping man from enjoying this face-to-face fellowship with God. There was a veil there, okay? This veil is, is really important. You know, we were all taught that the veil was God giving man the stiff arm like the Heisman Trophy, you know? Like, like man all the time trying to get in there and God's like, eh, stiff arming him. Nope, sorry. But the veil was not put up by God, Okay? And we're going to get into all this, and it's going to get real clear what the veil is. So the veil was a picture of what was separating man from experiencing the presence of God. It represented what was keeping man from a face-to-face fellowship they were created for with the, the Father of all glory. This veil that kept man out of the presence of God, that kept man from a face-to-face fellowship with God, was not God. The veil that kept man from the holiest place or the face-to-face fellowship with God they were created for is man's sin-stained conscience. The veil that kept man from the presence of God was their sin-stained conscience. Remember, sin is trusting in your own ability or trusting in the works of your own hands. And that trusting was propagated by knowing yourself according to the flesh. That's what a sin-stained conscience is. That conscience, when it became stained by that belief system, it created a persuasion in man's heart that made them feel unpleasing to God or that God was angry with them and it filled their hearts with fear at the thought of being in the presence of God. Now listen, if your heart's filled with fear when you're standing face to face with God, it's going to work death in you. Okay? You guys following that? So a sin-stained conscience is a conscience that is corrupted by what I must do to be acceptable and pleasing to God because I'm finding my identity in the flesh. I'm finding my identity in what I do and what the world says about me. Now this acts as a veil or a separating partition from experiencing the presence of God um, because uh, my heart will always be filled with fear at the thought of standing face to face with that God, okay? And the heart that is filled with fear in the presence of God will always be unto a life that can only be described as death and a life dominated by the fruit of death, okay? We were slaves to sin through the fear of death Our conscience was all the time filled with laboring and toiling to try to become acceptable to God as his children by bringing forth his fruit in our lives so we could feel confidence in his presence. That's what it meant to be a slave to sin. We were afraid to be in the presence of God. And so our conscience or our mind was all the time filled with laboring and toiling, trying to produce the fruit of God's life so that we could produce enough of God's fruit in our life and so we could see that fruit and think that fruit clothed us and then we would feel confidence in the presence of God. Okay? That's what a sin-stained conscience will produce. That's what it means to be a slave to sin. We were all our days in bondage through the fear of death. 
We were afraid of death standing in the presence of God. And so we were all the time enslaved to sin because we were trying to compensate for that fear. See what I'm saying? Now, the veil that kept man from enjoying the face-to-face fellowship they were created for with their heavenly father and the life that could be born from this fellowship was their conscience having been corrupted by knowing themselves according to the flesh. Or we could say because sin was dwelling in their heart. The veil that served to keep man from experiencing the presence of God and the fullness of the Godhead being born in them bodily was due to the fellowship mankind had with sin and their conscience or through their conscience being stained by sin. Okay, that's the veil. The veil doesn't represent God's angry with you. In fact, the Bible says, how can we come to God unless we first know that he's happy with us? (laughs) How can we ever even come to that God? unless we first hear that he's happy with us. The problem was that Adam didn't think God was happy with him, and so he ran away. So what would do away with that? As if man could think that God was happy with him. If Adam believed God was happy with him, he wouldn't have ran away. He would have kept standing face to face, glory to God. But he ran and he hid. Um, And we'll look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 20. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 through 20. It says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Okay, so what he's talking about here, um, the author of Hebrews, he's talking about how Jesus has consecrated a new way for us to enter into the holy place. And the reason he's talking about the holy place is because he's writing to Jewish guys. And the Jewish guys were busy performing the sacrifices and performing the works of the law of Moses, trying to make a way into the holy place. But under the law of Moses, only the high priest could enter one time a year. Nobody else could enter. So Paul comes in, or the author of Hebrews, if you don't like to believe it's Paul, he comes in and he says, there's a new new and a living way for us to enter into the holiest place. And that place that is new for us to enter is through the flesh of Jesus or through the blood of Jesus. So we have a way to enter into the holy place now that comes because of the precious blood of Jesus or that comes because its flesh was torn at the cross. Okay? Glory to God. So what gives us confidence to enter into the holiest place with boldness is having our conscience washed clean from sin By the blood of Jesus. What gives us confidence to enter the holy place is to see that we've been purged from sin once for all time at the cross through the precious blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus removes the veil that was keeping us from the holy place by washing our conscience clean from sin because our sin-stained conscience is what the veil was that was keeping us out. So the blood of Jesus washes our conscience clean from sin and in washing our conscience clean from sin it removes the veil that was acting as a separating partition keeping us from the presence of God. And now there's a new and living way to enter into that presence and stand face to face with the Father and find the Father's life being born in you. (laughs) I told you, sooner or later I'm going to turn into the Hulk. Honestly, what I desire to do is just to take this thing and... And not even have it. But I get, you know, there's guys that listen all over the world that don't speak English. And they're always messaging me. And, man, can you slow down? We know you're saying something awesome. But we can't get it. <laughs> oh. So, man, thank you guys for bearing with me. If you got used to the, 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 the Hulk, Greg, I promise you don't need me to, to do backflips up here for this word to be still full of power to set you free. The way that I'm preaching today is still full of power to bring forth God's life in you. <laughs> hey, I like it the Hulk way too, just so you know. Glory to God. So listen, in the gospel accounts, the gospel accounts tell us when Jesus was hanging on the cross, it said that Jesus cried with a loud voice, and he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. You guys all know that. We've all heard that, right? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now, after he cried out these words, it says he gave up the ghost or he died. So he cries out, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, and then he gives up the ghost, or he dies. Now, if you read the gospel accounts, immediately after he gave up the ghost, or he died, the veil was torn. The veil was torn from the top to the bottom in the temple, symbolizing that the separating partition that was keeping man out of the holy place was no more. It was gone, and it was gone in the moment that he died. Hallelujah. So, um, Where am I at? Okay, so what it means, or why was the veil torn in two when Jesus died? 
because that's very important. The veil was torn in two when Jesus died because it was the death of the man or the identity of man that was established in the flesh. It was the identity of man that was knowing themselves according to what they do, what they have, and what the world says about them that was keeping them separated. Now, Jesus came born of a woman, born under the law. He became us on the cross, and he became the image of what we thought of ourselves, and he died away that image, thus dying away the man that was knowing themselves according to the flesh, and so the veil was torn because it was the identity of man knowing themselves according to the flesh that kept them full of fear and kept them out of the presence of God which kept God's life from being born in them, okay? So all people now, when the veil was torn, and this is what Paul, or the author of Hebrews, man, I've said everybody, um, this is what Paul, the author of Hebrews, (laughs) you see what I want to say, right? I'm trying to be, uh, what is it, PC? (laughs) I'm not very good at that, guys. I'm not very good at PC, sorry. Um, So that's what... uh, the author of Hebrews was talking about when he said that in the new covenant, not just the high priest could enter once a year, but everybody from the least to the greatest could now enter into the presence of God. Okay, so all people from the least to the greatest could now enter the presence of God with boldness through the blood of Jesus, not just the high priest once a year, because through the flesh of Jesus being torn, through the blood of Jesus running out of his flesh at the cross, God made a way for us to enter the holiest place by purging sin from us, by washing our conscience clean from sin, by washing our conscience clean from knowing ourselves according to the flesh and sprinkling our heart clean from a wisdom of laboring and toiling to clothe upon our ourselves with our good works in an attempt to make a way for ourselves to enter into the holy place. You see what I'm saying? So now we'll recap that. Okay, all that, put it together, because we talked about pieces, pieces, pieces. So at the cross, God destroyed our fellowship with sin, and he washed our conscience clean when he sent our sin away from us through the precious blood of Jesus, and he died away the old man. Okay? He purged us from sin at the cross by dying away the identity of man that the first Adam established when he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Um, he cleansed us from our sin by suffering the wages of our sin in his death as us and for us on the cross. And by destroying the identity of man that found the report of who and what they are and God's view and opinion of them and what they do. Okay, that's how he destroyed our fellowship with sin or purged us from sin or forgave us or sent sin away from us. Okay, now, what God has done in Jesus to purge us from sin by sending our way, sin away from us so we can believe he is pleased with us is designed to make us whole by making a way for us to once again enter into the holy place. It's designed to make us whole or to have fellowship and communion with salvation by making a way for us to come with boldness into the presence of God and stare him right in the face in all of his glory, feel him breathing on us and actually just feel loved. You see what I'm saying? And then out of that place where I'm just feeling loved, perfect love has replaced fear now. And out of that place of just experiencing this love, I find that love being born in me bodily. And now I find I'm not just experiencing that love, but I find my whole spirit, soul, and body has been infused by the very love that is found in the Godhead. Thus making me whole. (laughs) Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. So that's how he restored us to being made whole. Now you see how he had to purge sin to make us whole. The purging of the sin was the washing of our conscience clean from knowing ourselves according to the flesh so we wouldn't feel afraid or unacceptable to God, but we would feel well-pleasing to God and we would feel perfect love in his presence instead of fear. So listen, man, if I've forgotten that he purged my sin at the cross, if I've forgotten that he died away the man that found the identity of his life in the flesh, if I've forgotten that he sent away for me the report of my life that was found in what I do, what I have, and what the world says about me, I'm still going to feel unacceptable to God. I'm still going to feel afraid to be in the presence of God. And so there will still be a veil in my heart working to keep me out of the holiest place, and it will keep his life from being born in my body. Glory to God. You see that? And that's what Peter is talking about when he says, if they don't find God's life born in them, they've forgotten that the man that found the report of his life was sent away from them at the cross. They've forgotten they were purged from sin. 
They were purged from life through the flesh. They were purged from knowing themselves by what they do. They were purged from thinking that God was knowing them by what they do. And if they've forgotten that that's what happened at the cross, they have no confidence or boldness to enter into the holiest place. And if they don't have confidence and boldness to enter into the holy place, then how can the fullness of the Godhead be born in them bodily? For in the presence of God is where the fullness of the Godhead can be born in a human being bodily. See what I'm saying? That's what causes a person to lack the manifestation of the fruit of God's life in them. They have a veil in their heart acting to keep them from the experiencing the presence of God. And it's acting to keep them from finding God's life born in them because they forgot what God has said and done in the death Jesus died at the cross. That's why. I hope I connected that well enough together. So listen, this defines the only message that there is to preach if we think a person lacks the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Do you see that? You see, what we've done in the church for so long is we've looked out and we said, well, these guys aren't really living right. Um, they're not really, and we, that was the wrong definition to begin with. We should really look out like God looked out when he looked at man and said, my children aren't experiencing my life. And then feel compassion towards people. And then think, what is it that I could do that could save them from this death that's reigning over them and allow them to experience the life I created them to experience? What can I do? I know what I can do. I can incarnate myself into a human being. I can be their representative. And then I can die away their death on the cross as their representative. And then I'll set them free from a life that can be born from walking in the flesh. And then I will raise them up and seat them at the right hand of Jesus. And there will be a spirit identity of man. And they can see that spirit that report and believe on it and then that spirit can be born in them and then they can experience life in the spirit glory to God <laughs> and so if I see a people who aren't experiencing God's life I don't come with a word that says you should you should you should you should I don't come with a word that says you're not you're not you're not I don't come with a word like that because that's not the thing that is causing them to not experience God's life. The thing is, they've forgotten they were crucified with Christ. So the only word I'm ever going to come with is to remind them about the death they died with Jesus and what that thing means. I'm going to come with the word that can persuade their heart about how beautiful they are to God. I'm going to come with the word that can persuade their heart about how happy God is with them. I'm going to come with the word that tells them they don't lack glory. They don't lack honor. Why? And I will come with the word that says the reason why you can believe this is true is because that picture you have in your heart that was painted from what you did, what you do, what you have, and what the world says about you, that picture was crucified at the cross. And that picture can no more define who you are or what God thinks of you. And that's the only word that should ever be preached in the church if we think there's a lack of the fruit of the Spirit or um, we see a manifestation of the fruit of the flesh. You can never find the fruit, of life's, the fruit of God's life born in you by looking at that fruit and saying, that's the fruit I'm supposed to have, let me imitate it. You can never find the fruit of God's life born in you. That's called walking after the flesh. That acts as a veil, keeping you from experiencing God's life. Glory to God. So if they lack the, the, God's life manifesting in them, it means they've never really heard the cross. And if I'm just being honest, I, you know, I, I've been saved since I was like five, four, three, I don't even know, as old as I could talk. You know, pray the Lord, I walked around saying. But, but I never knew what happened at the cross almost my whole Christian life. <laughs> and I find most Christians I meet don't have any idea what happened at the cross and what it means. They have a different kind of an idea, an idea that doesn't come from God but comes from the serpent. If the serpent wants to keep you experiencing his quality of life, what's he going to do? He's going to come in and try to pervert the word that God spoke in Jesus to set you free. And that's what we've all heard in the church for 1,500 years now, a perverted word, a word that points at you and says, what are you doing wrong and what should you be doing right? <laughs> Uh, so the message of the cross or the message of the gospel does not consist of you need to be obedient to God by doing X, Y, and Z. That's not, that's not the message of the cross. It does not consist of, well, look how Jesus died for you. You should be living right. Go clean yourself up and do some good deeds. That's not the message of the cross, man. 
That's not the message of the cross. That kind of a message will actually serve to create a veil in the hearts of people, keeping them from experiencing the presence of God and causing them to lack the manifestation of his life in them because that word will cause them to forget what happened at the cross. They will forget that they were purged from sin because now I come with the word that reinforces an identity that's born from what they do. I come with the word that tells them, look what you're doing and not doing. Now I'm defining them by the, what they do. I'm actually defining them by the thing that God went through all that trouble to die away. Glory to God. And then we'll, we'll finish up here with this explanation. And it might go on for a little while because I like it. But, and, and we have a long-standing rule here, guys. We live offense-free. I, I go on sometimes. If your rear end has had all it can take, we will not think badly of you if you want to go. If you're hungry and, and you feel like, man, I want to go, no one here is going to scowl at you or think, well, they just don't love the Lord. <laughs> right? I mean, you see the religious mindset that's been planted in church. Listen, if you've had all you can take, glory to God. That's okay. So the deal is, I'm free to preach as long as I like, and you're all free to, man, get up and walk out if you've had all you can take. And it's okay. No one will judge you. Please don't judge me for my much speaking. <laughs> you see, uh, freedom works both ways. Hallelujah. So um, when we want to think of sin um, and faith, as two wisdoms, and each wisdom, we want to think of, I'm going to say that again, because so for long we, we only thought of faith as what we do. There's a difference between my faith and the faith. The faith is a noun. It's a thing, okay? It's the persuasion that's in the heart of God, okay? Sin is also a wisdom. It's a persuasion that was born from Satan, okay? So we want to think of, um, when we think of sin and faith, we want to think of two wisdoms, okay? And we want to see that each wisdom paints a picture of who we are. Each wisdom paints a picture of who we are. One picture leaves us sick by keeping us from experiencing the presence of God and causing us not to experience the manifestation of his life in us, okay? And um, one picture makes us whole by immersing us into the fellowship found in the Godhead and giving birth to the fullness of the Godhead in us bodily. So we got two pictures going on, okay? Now remember, when we think of the picture sin will paint of us in our hearts, we are talking about sin as the wisdom that says the report of who and what I am is found in the flesh. It is found in what I do, in what I have, and what the world says about me, okay? So what sin will do is it will take everything we see about ourselves in our flesh. It will take every voice the world has ever given about our life to define us. It will take... Um, every word or accusation that has ever come against us. It will take every failure we think we've ever had in this earth. It will take all those things, and it will paint a picture of us with those things. And then it will come to us with this picture and present it to us, okay? In order to try to get us to believe that that picture is the truth about who we are, okay? You guys following that? Maybe, um, maybe there's a voice telling you that your life is a failure because you did not accomplish what you wanted to do. Maybe there's a voice telling you that you're unlovable. Maybe there's a voice telling you that nobody likes you, that you, you don't have any friends, that you're not friendly enough, that nobody likes you because you don't have any friends. Maybe you have a voice telling you that you've committed so many sins. Look at all the horrible things you've done. Maybe you have a voice telling you um, that you could have done so much more in your life and it was just a waste because look what you did. That's the picture sin's trying to paint of you. That's the picture sin's trying to create in your heart because sin wants to keep you sick. It wants to make you sick by causing you to know yourself according to its picture of you because that picture will keep you from the presence of God and keep you from the fullness of the Godhead being born in you bodily. So sin is all the time trying to paint this picture of you. For me, uh, the picture sin tried to paint of me was, Greg, you're too intense. You're too much for people. You're too bold. Look at what you could have done. You're such a failure. You could have played basketball in college. You could have ran in the Olympics. You could have got a PhD and you blew it. Look at all the sin you committed. Look at all the drugs and alcohol you abused. Look at all the failures you have. Look at all the things you didn't do for God. Look at what you should have done. That's sin coming to me, trying to paint a picture of my life, trying to define me by this world. And it isn't just happening to me. That's what sin does to everybody in the earth. That's its way. That's the message of Satan. Because Satan wants to be your God, so he wants to plant his wisdom in your heart so that you experience his life called death along with him. 
You see what I'm saying? So this is sin trying to paint a picture, guys, of us that is contrary to the picture God painted of, of us in Christ. God's a great artist, man. I like his picture much better. <laughs> you, you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so um, do you see the way sin was marring my image by beating me up blow by blow? It's like I was just taking blows. Boom. If anybody has seen boxing or a boxing match, you saw the way Rocky, uh, the Rocky movies, how Rocky was really beat up by Apollo Creed to where you couldn't even really make out who he was anymore. That's what sin's trying to do to you. It's delivering blow by blow. It's trying to mar the image that you have of yourself. It's trying to destroy what you think of yourself. So the end goal of sin marring the image and likeness of ourselves is so we can no longer recognize who we are. So we can no longer recognize ourselves as the image and likeness of God. So that we can no longer recognize ourselves as the beloved sons and daughters of God, full of glory and honor, in whom he's well pleased. So we can no longer recognize ourselves as the apple of God's eye. So we can no longer recognize ourselves as the one that God got down on in one knee and said, I adore them. You see, it wants to destroy that belief in our heart. It wants, us to, it wants to separate us from who we are. It wants to keep us um, sick, okay, so we can no longer know ourselves the way God has always known us. You hear that? God didn't change his mind about you, all right? Sin is trying to mar us so we don't know ourselves for who we really are, but also so that we can't see ourselves the way God has always known us. Okay, because when you can know yourself the way God has always known you, then man, you really start living. And that's really the key. It's not that I'm trying to persuade myself of what God has said. It's that I see the heart of God and I see that God has believed something about me. And I see that he revealed what he believed about me in the person of Jesus Christ. And so now I'm not trying to convince myself or work some psychiatry to trick my head. I just keep beholding the word God has spoken about me in Jesus, for he has revealed the way he's always known me in the person of Christ. Glory Glory to God. Hallelujah. So this is, what, this is the end goal of sin marring your image. And what happens is, if sin is able to mar your image, um, like it did Adam, is we end up sick like Adam was in the garden, where we're feeling naked and feeling that we lack glory. And we feel afraid and ashamed to be in the presence of God. And we're all the time laboring and toiling, trying to bring forth the fruit of God's life by the sweat of our brow right? In an attempt to make a way for us to feel confident in the present, confidence in the presence of God by clothing upon ourselves. You know, God told Adam that was part of the curse from eating from that tree. He said, you will work by the sweat of your brow. You will work and labor to try to produce my fruit, and you'll never be able to. You'll only be able to produce thorns and thistles. That's a picture of us, guys. If we don't, if we let sin mar our image with its picture, what will happen is, is we'll be like Adam, we'll live under the curse, and we'll all the time be laboring and toiling um, to bring forth fruit by the sweat of our brow, and we'll only bring forth the fruit of death. And every time, we'll feel more naked, and our image will get worse and worse, and we'll feel more and more like we're the forsaken of God. We'll feel more and more like God has turned his back on us, even though he never turned his back on us. Glory to God. So the image sin painted of us in our hearts made us sick because it acted as a veil to separate us from experiencing the life and fellowship we were created for from the platform of sun in the Godhead. Forgiveness is God sending the picture sin painted of us away from us by dying away that image at the cross in order that the veil could be torn and we could come boldly into the presence of God through the blood of Jesus and then be made whole. You see what I'm saying? Remember, whole is to be in the presence of God and to find his life born in you. That's whole, okay? Now, Isaiah, Isaiah says some beautiful things, man. And uh, I just, I, the more I get a hold of this, the more it just blows my mind. But I, Isaiah says that Jesus was marred beyond recognition. Um, and it says when we looked upon him in the state that he was in, marred beyond recognition, we esteemed him smitten and stricken of God. It doesn't say that God smitten and struck him. It said that we looked upon Jesus. He was marred beyond recognition. And we looked upon him and we said, surely this is the rejected of God. Look at him. 
Look how ugly he looks. Look how this death that he's dying on the cross. This is the worst crucifixion that could ever happen. Surely this guy is the smitten and stricken of God. Surely God has rejected this guy. Okay? But Isaiah goes on to say that Jesus carried our griefs and our sorrows. That he bore our sicknesses and our diseases. Jesus became the image that sin painted of us in our hearts at the cross. Jesus became what we believe about ourselves at the cross in the death that he died. The marred beyond recognition that he was was because he became what we thought about ourselves at the cross so that we could behold ourselves in him. We could see the lie that we believed about ourselves so that that lie could be blown up and destroyed. So what Jesus did was he entered into our darkness. He entered in and he became the picture that we had of ourselves in order that that picture could be destroyed when God would raise him from the dead and seat him at the right hand and he could present us with a new picture and this new picture of who we really were could now shine light into our darkness and it could be a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our way leading us back into the holy place where we're standing face to face with the Father and we find his life being born in us and thus being made whole. He entered your darkness, man. He became the image you had of yourself. You believed you were the smitten and stricken of God. You believed God had forsaken you. That made it impossible for any of us to trust God with our life. And so he had to come in and blow up the lie by entering into the lie. He entered our history and he destroyed what we thought of our history and he became our history. Glory to God. Glory to God. So God wanted to present us with the picture he painted of us so that we could have something to believe on um, that could heal us and that could make us whole by making a way for us to experience his life, okay? So we see the picture God paints of us, and we're like, it just hits you like a ton of bricks. And you're like, oh, my gosh. Oh, it, you almost can't talk. You, can barely, you know, I, I can barely choke back the tears just thinking about this thing. And he created this picture so that we could see God's picture of us. We could believe on that picture, and then his spirit could dwell in us. And then what his spirit will do is all the time be working to create the picture God has in his heart of us in our hearts so that we can have the same picture. And that's why it says it's the spirit of truth or that the spirit guides you into all truth. Glory to God. And so the Spirit is in your heart shining light into your darkness by revealing what God believes about you in the resurrection and the ascension. And this will upset all my, all my friends that, that come from uh, focusing on healing, and we believe in healing. But what I just described is the fulfillment of the Scripture that says, um, by whose stripes we are healed. <laughs> by whose stripes we are made whole. You see, by his flesh being torn, by us seeing the blood run out of the identity of man that was established in the flesh, it makes us whole, it heals us from our griefs and our sorrows, it heals us from our sickness and disease because it tears the, tears the veil and it makes a way for us to enter into the presence of God and find his life born in us and then I'm healed, I'm made whole, I'm no more sick because I'm experiencing the life of my design and I'm walking every day of my life seeing myself as son. That's how you get made whole, man. That's the fulfillment of the scripture, by whose stripes we are healed. <laughs> Glory to God. I promise we're almost done. I promise. But this stuff is so good. If it's not making you happy, I'm getting happy. And so it's, it's for me. Bear with me. Bear with me. It's for me. So listen, faith comes in and it acts as an eraser. It comes in and erases the image sin painted of us. And it tells us we are dead to the image sin painted of us. And then faith paints a picture of us that is like unto Christ and him crucified that shines his light into our darkness. Faith tells us we've been purged of our sin at the cross in the body of Jesus' death. It tells us our sin has been forgiven us through the blood that ran out of Jesus at the cross. It tells us our flesh has been washed clean with pure water. It tells us we are dead to an identity that can be defined by what we do, what happens to us, and what the voice of the world says about us. Faith comes in and tells us we do not lack glory and honor. Faith comes in and it paints a picture of who we are that is like unto the glory and honor that the Father ascribed to Jesus when he raised him from the dead. That's the picture faith is painting, man. Glory to God. 
So listen, the image, and I'll just keep recapping it because this is a complicated thing for people, and so if I say it enough times, it'll stick. But the image sin painted of us made us sick because it acted as a veil to separate us from the presence of God. Forgiveness is God sending away from us the sin, the picture sin painted of us in order that we could come boldly into the holiest place and be made whole. So if I have forgotten that sin has been purged for me, that it has been forgiven me, I will live my life knowing myself according to the picture sin painted of me. And that picture will leave me sick and lacking the fruit of God's life because it will create a veil in my heart keeping me from experiencing the face-to-face fellowship with God I was created for. If I've forgotten that my sin was purged for me, I will continue living my life by the picture sin painted of me. You see that? Because the cross died away that picture. And if I don't remember that it was died away, I'll keep walking through this life all of my days thinking that that's the real picture of who I am. The picture that we see at the cross, marred, ugly to God, un, not pleasing to God. That's what the Pharisees were saying to Jesus. You're God's beloved son, really? <laughs> you see that? So if I find myself in the place where I'm living my life, um, from the foundation of the picture sin painted of me, I'm in need of hearing or being reminded I was crucified with Christ so my heart and mind can be washed clean from sin by seeing the blood that has run out of the identity of my life that was established in the flesh. So my heart and mind can be washed clean by seeing the paint sin used to create an image of me running off of the canvas and no more being there. And I can see that that paint just running off of that canvas And my mind and my heart can be washed clean from that image that sin painted of me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. I thank you, Father, that with everlasting kindness, that with unending and perpetual kindness, you have pursued us, that you have pursued us with your love, that you have pursued us with the desire to reveal what you have always believed about us, that you have pursued us with the desire to paint a picture of who we are that is like unto the picture you have in your heart of us, so that that picture can be born in us, so that we can believe and your spirit can come and dwell in us, and that spirit can shine your light in our heart. Thank you, Father, that this message, that this word will go out across the earth, and that it is full of power to make people whole, that it's full of power to usher them in to the holy place with boldness. It's full of power to um, cause your life to be manifest in them. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Man, if anybody hasn't believed on Jesus, you don't have to make a spectacle of yourself. You could just say in your heart right now, Father, I had no idea you were this good. I believe. I believe that you love me. I believe that you died away my death. I believe that Jesus is the only voice about my life, and you can find his spirit born in you right now. You can just think that in your heart. You can say it out loud by yourself. You don't have to make a spectacle up here. Glory to God. If anybody needs prayer, I want to talk.